Welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to today's History Hack, for which I am massively excited. Um, I'm, like, I'm not even exaggerating about how excited I am because may have been spending the last week and a half messaging the guests. So, uh, Alex Larbin, hello. Hello. Oh, I'm so glad you're back. You're like, you're like my buddy in royal history circles uh, because we bump up against the same topic, uh, but you do after I do. So let's give you a proper intro. Alexander Larman is an author and historian whose previous books include The Crowning Crisis, which was a blow-by-blow account of Edward VIII's abdication in 1936. But we all know that that isn't the end of the Edward. Um, I've put in my notes the Edward fuckery, um, and I, I don't think that's too much. Um, there was much more to come. And so after that book, he decided to carry on and tell the full story. So now he's back with an excellent sequel, which is making big waves in the literary world. It's the Windsors at War. So Alex, welcome. It's lovely to be back here. It's brilliant. Chris, Chris is here basically to see the Duke of Windsor get what's coming to him. Oh, well, we're not going to let you down on that score, Chris. I can promise you that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's because we did that one on um, Hitler's aristocrats the other day and we, we just spent did. the whole time saying we can't talk about Edward VIII we've got to wait we've got to wait it was like yeah. well, I've got to wait you know I've got to can't wait so yeah I've been looking forward <laughs> to this all week as well yeah so Alex we had uh, another historian on who had done aristocrats that sort of were in Hitler's back pocket yeah. and um, every time she mentioned uh, the Duke of Wins I was like oh, I'm gonna have to stop you there in case I say something that's in Fargo uh, so god love her she's uh, she gets a whole episode at a later right. date to trash Daddy Kennedy so she's happy um, yeah. But we did leave the field wide open for you. So the Duke of Windsor and his wife uh, are, are quite a popular subject, obviously, otherwise we wouldn't be talking about it now. But one might ask, why another book? And so, Mr. Larman, why is the moment right for yet another book about this? Well, it's, it's, a, good, it's a good question, Chris. The first answer to that is that I finished writing The Crowning Crisis a few years ago. And usually when you finish writing a a historical book, there's always a slight sense of relief, actually, because you think I've lived with these characters. I've ate and drank and slept with these characters and um, I I'm done now. I can go to something else. But with Crown and Crisis, it was very different because I thought, hang on, I send Edward and Wallace out of Britain at the end of it. And I thought, come on, you can't stop there. While I was doing a promotion for the book, the question I kept being asked over and over and over again, nothing about the abdication, nothing about the, you know, stuff I thought was fascinating or the machinations and the shenanigans. Was it, was he a Nazi? Was he a Nazi? The <laughs> yeah. question I've been asked most. So I thought, okay, that's the central thing I'm going to tackle in this book. But then as I came to research it, and as I went to, especially the Royal Archives, but all these other archives all over Britain, I thought, okay, yeah. You can answer that question in fairly conclusive detail, but there's also this whole wider world, and you're looking, and of course this has become really quite pertinent, at the relationship between him and his brother, because you've got the one who's dutiful and terrified and trying to be, you know, the best king he could in very, very difficult circumstances, and you have the other one, and this is nothing like current affairs, who goes off with his American wife, Please the country, leaves everybody else in the lurch, and basically whines about privilege, whines about his wife not being appreciated enough. So I, so I can't think what you might be referring to. No, no, it's uh, and also in fact the book is called The Windsors at War. Now, <laughs> I mean, the time- Interpret that how you will, people. The timing of publication is entirely serendipitous because that Prince Harry very kindly published his book about he and his brother at war a couple of months ago means that it's coming out as essentially the historical version of that particular best-selling book. So if you liked Spare, you'll like The Windsors at War. And if you didn't like Spare, you'll probably like Windsors at War as well, I think we'll say. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, yeah, oh, let's not even touch. Let's not even touch Harry. Although I was talking today, we were saying he wants to be glad he wasn't the third son. Otherwise, he'd be a vicar. <laughs> he really have something to whine about. Right. OK, 
let's set the scene first, right? So right at the beginning of this book, I loved it because I know you. Uh, yeah. We've had some chuckles about where this book was going to go. Um, yeah. And we see eye to eye on quite a lot with the Duke yeah. of Arkansas. So I yeah. open the book and there you are with an Oscar Wilde quote and a quote from Genesis. You go full <laughs> Old Testament before you've even started <laughs> writing. That there's some big guns. So can you explain why? And why you chose it, as in, why is it an acceptable frame of reference for immediately after the abdication? Okay, well, the Oscar Wilde quote, first of all, because something that I tried to do with both Crowning Crisis and Winds of the War was, it's, I mean, both books I see, it's always very interesting, because I always regard what I'm trying to do in a book, rather like, you know, you might regard if if you're doing a novel or a film. And I regarded both The Crowning Crisis and Winds of the War as comedies of manners to some extent, but a lot of these people's behaviour would seem to a visitor from, you know, outer space is utterly bizarre. So the idea was, was that Evelyn War was very much kind of influence on both the writing and the subject matter of Crowning Crisis. And with this one, it's the idea of Oscar Wilde and the importance of being earnest. It's the idea of, um, you know, deception and people pretending to be things they're not. But I, I always loved that line from the picture of Dorian Gray, when he says, oh, brothers, I don't care for brothers, you know. My my older one won't die, and my younger ones do nothing else. So that to me was all was quite. A, it was it was a comment on the royal family and the four brothers who are all to a greater or lesser extent fighting each other. But the Genesis one, I mean, as you say, if you're going to go <laughs> Old Testament and you're going to go properly biblical, you got to go Cain and Abel, really, don't you? I mean, with these two, yes. But it's that, but it's the line that I quote as, "Am I my brother's keeper?" And essentially, because you always do the epigraphs when you finish a book and you want to find a phrase or an idea that's going to sum up what you've said. And that one line for me, I think, does sum up what I've tried to say. And and it's you could say it of either of them. I mean, Edward believed to a large extent that he was Bertie George's protector and mentor and all the rest of it. And of course, the king increasingly found himself having to stand in the way when it came to his elder brother and his increasingly treacherous activities. So you can look at it and this and the rivalry between the two of them and the very intense dynamic. And you think to yourself, that question is the one that I think you try and answer throughout the book. Am I my brother's keeper? And so that's why I thought it was a very apposite quote. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think I named my cat after the other brother. So it's it's not <laughs> like my, my colours are nailed to the wall as it is. Um, I'm going to there's a quote in the book uh, and, and I, I've, I've just picked one of one of the ones that is is symptomatic. I think don't be weak. Don't be rude. Be firm and make him ashamed of himself. That's Wallace to Edward about George the Sixth, about Bertie. So what is the dynamic like between them as a couple throughout the course of this book? How should we process like how they operate together? Because, I mean, they very much sold themselves as a united front, didn't they? That was the whole point of them running away in the first place because they couldn't be without each other. So now they are this couple. How do they how do they go about their day to day lives? Well, what's interesting is I think by the time that this comes out, the first review of a book should be published in the Spectator. And mm. because, because I'm the uh, I'm one of the editors at the Spectator, I've seen the re- review in advance. There's always that slight moment of what's it going to be like? And actually, thankfully, it was a very interesting, very insightful, though flattering review. So I was very pleased with it. But what the critic did say is that the women recede in this book and that it's a man's history written by a man. And I thought about that. Because I thought that while I was writing Crown and Crisis, Wallace was so central to the book and so central to Edward's life. In this, she isn't as central, which is partly because we do not have the material that we have back then. Because we have a letter that she wrote to her aunt, Bessie Merriman. But what we do not have is the correspondence between her and Edward. So to an extent, we do not have the access and the information about their relationship that we did, which is annoying because what you want to delve into is this very weird sadomasochistic psychosexual dynamic between the two of them. Mm. And what you can say is that it was always a relationship where she was the dominant one and he was very much the submissive one. And you can and that's say- constantly what he looked for. Yeah. Constantly. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what you can see is that Ed, Edward, I mean, as Philip, as the late Philip Ziegler said to me, he sex meant a lot to him, but a very specialised form of sex. He mm. craved to be dominated. And while we don't have the stories that we have in 1936 of his basically being treated like a sort of 
a very badly behaved lapdog. What we do have is a sense of Wallace being top dog at all times, everything being done to please her, to satisfy her, and generally keep her on an even keel. But of course, the, the difficulty is, is that, I mean, something which is a recurring theme is Edward going on and on and on about her being given the HRH title that's going to yeah. make, she didn't care. I mean, it just didn't matter to her nearly as much as it mattered to him because she was much more interested in things like money and jewels because he was... That was her thing. Her thing is have, it's utter terror at being poor, isn't it? Yeah, precisely. Well, it's, it's, it's the tramp fear, isn't it? Because she yeah. grew up without money. There's always the worry that, you know, because if you think about it, you've, you, you've met a king. You think to yourself, well, I'm never going to have to worry about money or riches or status ever again. And then the, the king becomes an ex-king. So all the worries come back to you. And I mean, yes, it's always interesting because you, you look at your book. There's always a point, probably around publication, that you, you're reading it to do interviews like this. And you do think to yourself, that's something I would have liked more of. And I think actually, because the dynamic between the two of them, it's such a fascinatingly weird one. But the good thing is, is that in my next book, which is about the relationship between them after the war, there's a lot more of that. So it's not a, it's it's not an unexplored area, shall we say? This is great because you've essentially written three sequels to the book I'm writing. So. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> in the end, there'll be four books by the two of us. You'll oh, have brilliant. done most of the work. Let's be honest. <laughs> but they can read about the whole Surrey mess from his birth all the way up to the end. I think, yeah, because after because the next book's going to be out about this time next year. After that, I think I'm done with the Duke of Windsor because... Uh, I don't know how you've done it for three books. I mean, I'm like 20% of the way into one and it it's, it's, it's hard work. I don't think I've ever been so unempathetic with a subject ever that I've well, written about. Well, <laughs> it's always funny because one always has one's favourite bits of a book. I think one of my favourite bits of Windsor's War is the introduction where... I, I list the quote for everybody quoted when I give them a kicking of a crowning crisis. About it's brilliant. Them. Please read. Can I? Can I actually? Can yeah. I read that out? Because yeah. I know. Because by then the the embargo, I don't think they'd care about the introduction. Oh, no, anyway, no, but, I, mean, I mean, it's off. The book was out yesterday. This is going to go out on the tenth of March. Uh, so everybody best be off and ordering this book right now. But this this is when I knew that you were my royal historian soulmate because at the very yeah. beginning. You said, because you did take a bit of a kick in um, for being negative about him. Uh, You said, I cannot say I have warmed to him during my research. I've been accused of harshness towards Edward, whom I described in the crowning crisis as a wretched ruler, an obsessed and demanding lover, and by the odd instance of compassion and decency, a selfish and thoughtless man. My only regret, this is you, is that I've been too generous towards him. <laughs> if there is a public figure of comparable standing, and I'm watching Chris's face as I read this, who displayed the lack of self-awareness, non-existent consideration for others, and disdain for any reasonable standard of behaviour as the Duke of Windsor, their name should live in infamy. <laughs> yes, I mean, you're looking at, you know, Paul Pot. I mean... Ian Brady. I mean, you're looking at some really quite bad people to try and get down to that sort of level because, and you can say, oh, but you know, he was just a, a spoiled rich kid. I mean, he didn't kill anyone. And you think, well, that's a debatable thing. <laughs> I mean, the question is to what extent the treachery results in anyone's deaths. So, well, okay, getting... right. He's abdicated. Yeah. He's buggered off. He goes to Austria yeah. to wait for her. Yeah. Um, their existing friends are jumping ship already, aren't they? Discuss. And how does the how does the Duke react to this? Is he humbled? Well, what it is, is it's a mixture of things. I mean, they're really boring company. What is very interesting is that there is one royal commentator who shall remain nameless, but I have no idea how this woman gets work. Because what she goes on and on and on about how brilliant Wallace Simpson is. And you think, sorry. I was talking about the same woman here, because the Wallace Simpson, who I have come to know from my research, was not this sparkling witch. She was this harsh, difficult, demanding person. Who... Um, I would just go with mean. The letters and the documents yeah. that I had already, I haven't done a lot from the 1930s yet, but I, she just comes off as mean. Yeah, me, but in both senses, both financially mean and personally mean. 
I mean, she's not as bad as he is, but then who is? Well, I just do you not think that they just brought out the very worst in each other. Yeah. I don't think either, anyone else would have had either of them. I think it's lucky they found each other. Yeah, but she was married to two people before him. I mean, that's the thing. It's the, the, the difficulty is, is that what, what I feel about the Duke and Duchess of Windsor in this period, let's say between 1937 and 1940, mm-hmm. they're very boring. Mm. Because they've lost the glamour and the cachet that attached itself to them through his being king. And it's a bit like, imagine you've been doing a job, a very high-powered job, and you're the you're CEO of some quite exciting company. And then you lose your job, but you think to yourself, oh, everyone's been sucking up to me. I can just carry on, you know, this amazing life, and everyone still wants to come to my dinner parties. No, they went to your dinner parties because you're a, a big-shot CEO. It's a bit like that with Edward. People didn't like him because he was witty and charming and generous, because he wasn't any of those things. They liked him because he was king. Mm. And of course... <laughs> What's interesting is that I say in the introduction to Winter's of War that Crown and Crisis is a book about kingship, about what it's like to be king, and what it's actually, you know, I've tried very hard to put myself into the head of Edward while I was trying to abdicate. Winter's of War is not about kingship to the same extent. I mean, obviously, I deal with Bertie, I deal with George's utter reluctance to be king, and that's important. But, I, it, but it's not any more about the Duke of Windsor not wanting to be king because he's not king anymore it's more about the idea that you would feel sorry for him and wallace and the absolute misery and boredom of their lives if they were so horrible but they brought it on themselves i mean how can I mean, it really is sympathy for the devil isn't it but <laughs> you see the trouble is is that what i've struggled with and this is where i stand apart from the vast majority of royal historians a lot of people would essentially come down to the fact that if you're a member of a royal family, you deserve respect. And that is something which is, it's just a given. Whereas I just don't see it like that. I, I don't think you automatically merit respect because you are. Yeah, I, I think that maybe you do to an extent, but I think there's a certain level. This is where I stand on him. Um, again, like you and I have been like up to our next in the documents. Um, is that there is a line that you can cross whereby you forego that respect. You can behave badly enough that you don't deserve it. And for me, he crosses that line. The only thing is, is that, I mean, ha- speaking to you, having written a subsequent book and mm. seeing the whole story from 36 to 53, mm-hmm. there are some things that Edward Wallace did that are so awful, they're actually really funny. I mean, one of the things I, I find exceptionally funny is that they had a private euphemism for what it was like if somebody was drunk. And they'd always say, they feel no pain. I mean, that's really funny. I mean, you can't deny that that's, a sort of, that's a really nasty, witty thing to do. But, but I suppose that's it, isn't it? But if you are these contemptuous, bitter people, all the, you know, all the nice euphemisms in the world don't actually make you a more appealing person to deal with. And I think that ultimately, we take, yes, we take what happens, we take his sojourn in Austria, their extraordinarily strange wedding, and then what happens while the world's about to go to war. And you just think to yourself, everybody else is absolutely shitting themselves at the prospect of armed conflict. And what are Edward and Wallace doing? They're sitting around in the pool drinking cocktails and moaning, you can't get the staff these days. Uh, so it's the it's the one where their holiday is messed up and she goes it's almost like Mussolini's starting a war just to ruin our holiday I read it and I was like I'm just gonna read that again because I'm not sure that she yeah she did write that she did oh my god <laughs> one of the really annoying things is is for, I mean I don't know how many hundred thousand words I've written it I mean because I do see this sort of trilogy of books as being one very very long book in three parts which, I mean, if, if I was really generous, I'd just get my publisher to, to bring out one massive compendium edition, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> oh, I, don't, I don't do all that work for one set of royalties, don't <laughs> we? <laughs> maybe, maybe one day, maybe after you know, the books have all gone out of print, I'll encourage somebody to bring out the Lord of the Rings-esque size. But what you can see is that essentially there's so many good stories generally revolving around something utterly unbelievable one or the other says. And there just isn't space to get them all in. I mean, there's so many quotes you just come across. It's like, what? Yeah, I know it is. There's like a moment where you're like, I'm going to reread this because I think I may have read this wrong. 
no, no, I didn't read it wrong. It's real. It's real. And somehow I've got to not be a bitch about this when I write about them. I think what I do want to say, because I, we're already, I mean, we knew we were going to give them both a kicking on this interview yeah. because it's me and you. And that's why Chris is here because he wants to see it. Um, yeah. but, <laughs> Very much so. <laughs> yeah. It's important to say that this book is not an anti royal book whatsoever. Do you know what? I almost shed a tear at the last line where you pulled it round to Elizabeth II and <laughs> her the credit she deserved. It was beautiful. Um, and they're very much having read this book from cover to cover. One thing that comes shining out of it is the sheer effort that Bertie, George the Sixth, and Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, put into the role that they didn't ask for and the way in which they're not perfect at it during the Second World War. Um, it's still really new. It wasn't what they were expecting, but just... You cannot fault them for trying all the way through and just trying to maintain some sense of dignity in the face of the nonsense of his brother. Yeah, and that's absolutely it. I mean, I think that dignity is what George exhibited throughout. And what you're always doing is you're writing a series of character studies and you're looking into exactly how people behaved and what they cared about. And certainly, I mean... He wasn't flawless. And I mean, what I hope I get into is his relationship with Churchill was one where initially they really brought out the worst in each other. But then, of course, they actually formed a very close collaboration, which mm. I hope that, the I mean, it's a spoiler, but I hope that the last bit between the two of them is a bit affecting and tear-jerking. because that uh, Yeah, well, for someone with the surname Churchill, I was a bit weepy there as well. <laughs> well, that's what I wrote it to be, because ultimately... <laughs> Because, yeah, I mean, it's it's always interesting because something that I find is that you write about Churchill and it's very hard to write about him and make him fresh because he's such a well-known figure. But in, in a sense, you're taking this sort of totemic man and all you can do is, is just say, well, he did this, he did that. But the thing about Edward VIII is that actually most people don't know that much about him. And that's something I find really interesting that you say Duke of Windsor and then the question always comes back, was he a Nazi? But when you've got beyond the meeting Hitler and you've got beyond going out in 37, I mean, the Bahamas, not that's not that well known about. And then you've got this sort of, what else was he doing? And the answer is, well, he was betraying his country. That's what he was doing. <laughs> well, that and also as well, what you do know about him, if you know anything, is his words, it's his doing, it's his autobiography, it's his influence, it's him having the final say. And the man was, I mean, we, we, we're going to get to it. We're going to get to how he perceives himself versus how everyone else perceives them. But Chris, you are, of course, part German. I know where you want this conversation to go. Go on, <laughs> ask the question. Well, if, if it's just when we use the N-word, we get more clicks. So <clears throat> <laughs> let, let's use the N-word. Um, there, there's no smoke without fire. Um, how does all this social climbing result in the unfortunate links drawn between the Duke and Duchess of Windsor and a certain little corporal from Austria and all his little friends in uh, Berlin? Well, OK, was the Duke of Windsor a Nazi? No. Why wasn't he a Nazi? Because they wouldn't give him a rank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like... That's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas the, the chap who hosted his his wedding, you know, Charles Bedeau, he he was a Nazi. He was given a rank and everything. But to be honest, he's not alone, is he? I mean, like you can say, he, I mean, yes, he's a monumental dick in this sense. But Wilhelm II's had it. Yeah. Hitler plays him like a fiddle, sort of promising that he might be able to give him a throne back and that. And their relationship fluctuates between what this failed royal thinks he can get out of Hitler. And is he doing the same thing? Well, what I find very interesting, when you write a book like this, which you've spent a long time searching, a long time really getting to grips with, you walk away at the end and you think, right, that's the bit everyone's going to talk about. That's the really interesting chapter. That's the bit that maybe cry or laugh or whatever. Granny Crisis with two chapters. The first one was somebody trying to kill Edward VIII, which you can't blame him. I mean, it's a perfectly fair thing to do. And that got a fair bit of attention. I still maintain to this day should have got more attention because an MI5 agent trying to kill the king is quite a big deal, let's face it. But the other chapter was about Stanley Baldwin, a man who didn't like Edward VIII in the slightest, and standing up in Parliament to make up this amazing speech. And nobody took any notice of that, so we we'll chalk that one down to experience. But in this book... The things I think are very interesting 
oh, but obviously the Edward and, you know, Wallace stuff and the Nazis. But the fact that the royal family itself had a very high level of Nazi infiltration into it, the fact that both the Lord Stewards that George VI had were, I mean, I would say well, one of them was properly, you know, basically a paid up Nazi. And if you did give it any uniform, he would have worn it. And the other one, I think, was quite like Edward in terms of being somebody who he wasn't actually a Nazi, but he was so sympathetic and adjacent. But you're thinking to yourself, <laughs> you can imagine if he sat down with Hitler, had a few schnapps, it would have been, oh, go on then, you know, yeah. <laughs> I just find it fascinating because what I'm convinced about, and actually it's always annoying because, I mean, I finished this book quite a while ago, so I'm having to dredge things up from my memory to actually maintains what's current but what i do believe is that there's a lot of people in the upper classes who even after the outbreak of war were basically you know six of one and half a dozen of the other they were watching to see what happened and who was coming out on top even while their country was being bombed by the germans you can bet your bottom dollar that if hitler had invaded if operation sea lion had happened there would have been a lot of people at the highest levels of the aristocracy who would have gone over to fascism and not blinked. I'm not talking about people like Mosley or Diana Mitford. I'm talking about the kind of people who had very, you know, like, um, you know, Douglas Douglas Hamilton, the man who's, um, you know, he's an aviator, he's a Lord Steward, and he was also somebody who Rudolf Hess was flying to try and meet. And you can bet your bottom dollar that if things were slightly different, Hamilton would have been one of those people who was sitting next to Hitler and, you know, having a very good time with him. So the Duke of Windsor has to be seen in that context. But yeah, he's not alone, is he? No, no, and actually what's very interesting is that he wasn't making common cause with people in Britain. And that is something I find fascinating because when Edward and Wallace are in Portugal and the Nazis are working very, very, very hard indeed on them to try and recruit them over to the cause, what they should have done is to find other people in England and then used that as a conduit. Because the person who came out to actually basically save the country, Walter Monckton, who a very uh, underappreciated figure, I reckon, but we'll get mm. to him later. But if Edward and Wallace had been exposed to people like Douglas Hamilton at that point, I think the things would have got very interesting because ultimately Britain is in a very poor state until, you know, at least 1942, if not 1943. And you've got a situation where public appetite for war is not as strong as politicians might want it to be because appeasement because okay you're being told appeasement 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 no okay we've got to go fight now and actually you know everyone remembers the first world war everyone remembers the awful damage caused by that people don't really want to fight in fact you've got a lot of people not just you know the duke of windsor-esque lounge lizards but people like you know the press barons for the rothermeers for beaverbrooks mm -hmm. they are not desperate to see the country fight either because there's still this idea amongst a lot of people that hitler's not that bad a chap really and that is something that uh, if people are looking at germany they're thinking so this country which was in this appalling state after the first world war it is now being turned into, you know, a forward-looking, vigorous, I mean, in terms of the economic transformation, it's, it's a miracle. And they think, OK, fine. So, he, you know, killed a few political opponents. Well, so what? Killed a few treaties, killed a few people. Precisely. But, you know, look, but, but look at the economy now, you know, look what he's done. So, yeah, I think that what we can see is that what Edward was saying and doing was not so very far away from what a lot of other people at the highest levels of British society were saying and doing as well. And I think that if he had had the opportunity to go back and be king, or at least something like a king, to have been a president in a, in, in a Nazi-led republic, he would have done it, wouldn't he? I, I believe in, with all my heart, yes, he would have. Um, sure. Does that make him a dyed-in-the-wall um Nazi in terms of ideology I just I just think Edward did what was best for Edward at all times he hated Bolshevism as he called it he hated communism yes. he hated Russia that was his big thing and I think he always felt even after the end of the second world war 
You see in these letters that he wrote, there's there's lip service being paid to oh Hitler, all the evils of fascism, but his heart's not in it. Whereas mm. when he goes on about communism, I mean his anger when Attlee and the Labour government were elected in forty five is astonishing. So you can see that a lot of people, and I think he was just the most prominent, never really felt that Hitler was all that bad. They couldn't really understand why they were fighting them. And you see, <laughs> that's that's something of a problem, really, isn't it? It is. I mean, I think we've been fair in that we've pointed out that he is not the only um, person of high birth in the British Isles who's dabbling with fascism and sidling up to fascists. But he does go in 1937 to Nazi Germany. Does he have, and he, and he is unique in that he is an ex-king, does he have any business at all in taking part in even sort of pseudo-official nonsense like this? Does it undermine the already difficult position that he's dumped his brother in, or even the government? Well, he shouldn't have done it. I mean, there's no perspective on this earth that the former king should just be swarming around Nazi Germany. Because mm. he wasn't... Basically, the relationship that he had with Neville Chamberlain was one of at least semi-detachment. Because what I find very interesting is that there has been an attempt in recent years to rehabilitate Chamberlain, to say that he wasn't just this weak, ineffectual figure. To which I just say, bollocks, he, is, he was a weak, ineffectual figure. He didn't know what way anything was going. And the fact that he couldn't deal the Duke of Windsor in any meaningful or useful way is testament to his weakness and his uselessness. But the fact is, is that in 37, if it had been made clear to the British government that Edward was going to go out to Germany and associate with Hitler, you'd be thinking, OK, this is the propaganda coup to end all propaganda coups, because what this does is that this makes everything about the Nazi regime look acceptable. Because the fact is, is that Edward... <laughs> But something that I find interesting is that Edward's shifting public popularity in Britain during, before and during the Second World War was quite fascinating, actually, because there were definitely points at which I think if he'd returned to his home country, he would have been treated as the proper king. And George VI would have been treated as a kind of almost like, you know, he just came and, you know, kept the throne warm. Caretaker. Yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks for that. You can fuck off now. He's like Tony Pulis. Yeah. So you I think get, you got called in because the other guy wasn't available or wasn't doing yeah. so well, but uh, you've steadied the shit. Now you can bugger off because you're dull. Yeah, because what I think a lot of people find frustrating is that, that if, you're, is a, if you're king, it's not like being prime minister. They can't boot you out. Because mm -hmm. actually, I think the fact that Edward VIII was half booted, half jumped, made people think, oh, OK, well, we've done it once. Can we do it again? Because... I mean, there was definitely talk in the early years of George VI's reign that he wasn't up to the job and that there had to be some sort of regency imposed. I mean, there was even the discussion at one point about his brother, you know, Prince, you know, Gloucester, the Duke of, Duke of Gloucester becoming. Oh, God yeah. love it, but no, no. <laughs> I mean, really, if you're being absolutely honest, none of the sons of George V and Queen Mary were really ideal king material. Well, I mean, poor George is a drug addict. Yeah, well, you know, dear George. And then, of course, yeah, that, Bertie, that's covered in the book. Well, <laughs> also Nazi sympathies and uh, mm. quite a I like, mm. The stuff <laughs> about the crash was very interesting in your book. We'll go on to that later. But, um, yeah. but basically, yeah, I mean, this is the thing about royalty, but we were very lucky in that we had Elizabeth II for 70 years. Mm. And I suspect that she will go down in history as the greatest monarch there's ever been. I suspect that when we actually can take a bit of time away from it, I suspect there has never been a more consequential, more important monarch in English history. But in order to get there, we had to, you know, get through quite yes. a bit first. And I think that what, we, what you have with the Duke of Windsor is a man who, yeah, he would have liked to come back to Britain at some point, maybe, I don't know, 1939, and have been left alone Wallace could have been his queen. He could have done whatever he wanted. And I think, I mean, was he an anti-Semite? Probably. Was he a racist? Absolutely. Would he have looked the other way while the Jews were building gas chambers? Sorry, not the Jews, while the Nazis were building gas chambers on the Isle of Wight? Yeah, he would have looked the other way because it wouldn't have bothered him. And this is the thing. It's like 
it's quite easy for me to sit there and make sarcastic comments about the Chief of Windsor because it's really good fun and it's something that I've been doing now for years. And in fact, I can actually do that as part of my job is a wonderful thing to be doing. But the jokes and the banter do, I hope, not obscure the fact that he was a bad man. I mean, he was a really, really bad man. And, and had he that... not abdicated, we would not have a monarchy now. Yeah. That's my belief. And I will that I would die on that hill. Well, what you would have had is you would have had something like the King's Party, which is what he tried to do with Church and Beaver Book, because he would never have countenance to war with Germany. I would, I, mean, I do not believe for a second that he would have been done any. But that, that's the thing. It's like if we went to war with, say, I'm trying to think of somebody slightly unlikely but possible. If we went to war with um, Japan, and King Charles was vehemently opposed to this and said every five minutes about how we should be friends with Japan. We were a peace loving nation and they were as well. It puts the government in the most awful position because you're being undermined right, left and centre. So I think for what you can see with the Duke of Windsor, the fact that he genuinely did not believe we should be at war with Germany, is that you are undermining the war effort constantly. And so, yes, I mean, there are times that I, I never quite felt sympathetic towards the Duke of Windsor, but there are times you can read the book and read the material and you think, well, yeah, OK, he is being treated quite badly. I mean, there's the point at which he's out in France and he's actually genuinely trying to help in it after yeah. his passion. And he's just being frustrated and he's been told you know, he's been treated really, really badly. And I mean, yeah, you have to feel. I mean, because the thing is, is that, you know, this isn't some sort of two dimensional story. These are real people that you're writing about. And I mean, as with, because what I do as a writer is I think it's really vitally important when you've got all these letters and diaries to quote at length, because I feel that what you do is you're basically giving people the space and the opportunity to justify themselves because anyone can take, you know, I don't know, four sided letter and quote two lines out of context and make that sound as if you can support your argument. But I don't find that very satisfying, whereas if you've got a really good excerpt, if you've got a really in-depth amount of their own voice, then I think their characters come through much more strongly. And what I think, what I hope I've done is I've given the Duke of Windsor the platform that he would have wanted. I mean, let's do one last bit on character in that before we actually talk about the war and when war starts, because there is a big discrepancy, and we've kind of alluded to it already, between how people view the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. And that kind of fluctuates after the abdication, as you say, they sort of, they become non-entities and um, as opposed to being the centre of attention and sympathise with. Um, but, and, and the difference is between how they are viewed and how they think they should be viewed and received. It's huge, isn't it? Well, the difficulty is, it's, there's no newspaper in Britain that's publishing articles about how awful they are. Because you've got people like Lord Beaverbrook and Viscount Rothermere, the, you know, the Express and the Mail being the best selling papers in the country. They still remain personally sympathetic to the Duke and to a lesser extent the Duchess of Windsor. So what you have is also on the occasions of Edward doing anything, like when he goes back to Britain in 1939. It's very funny because the sort of running joke in, in the book is about that he keeps being told, don't be an attention seeker. Don't give any press conferences. And he tries to give press conferences everywhere he goes because he's so convinced people are desperate to hear what he's got to say. He's well, this sounds like, familiar. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. I mean, but also, I mean, something that you can't forget, we're dealing with very stupid people. I mean, we are, you know, as nothing much has changed in that regard, but we are dealing with, I mean, the Duke of Windsor is not an intelligent man. No. And that's why when you are confronted with people who are much more intelligent than you and more flatter you, that he's basically in, in a position where he can be manipulated and where he can be completely taken advantage of. And so, yeah, I mean, his character is essentially that of a venal man who has been told all his life, you can have whatever you want. And when he start, probably for the first time, to be told, no, 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 you can't have whatever you want anymore because you've given up the office and meant sure you could have whatever you want. Well, no, of course I can have whatever I want. And you start to think after a while, I mean, there's a line when his friend Fruity Metcalf said, oh, yeah, yeah, he, he, he was fine about everything until, you know, ever of a bill was produced, in which case he became frightful. And it's just the idea that somebody else would pay for him because it was considered such a privilege to be able to, be able to pay for the Duke of Windsor. And you think to yourself, but that's like stories I've heard about other members of the royal family, the idea that, 
you know, people are unfortunate enough to go on dates with them and be surprised. Oh, no, I don't carry cash. Why would I carry cash? <laughs> you enjoy yourself. Lucky I me. suspect I know exactly who you're talking about, but let's yeah. not get done for libel. We're talking about vain people who aren't very intelligent, who have a high opinion of themselves. What, what did Hitler, how did Hitler feel about them? Well, Hitler got one thing very badly wrong about Edward VIII when he was king. And that's where he believed that he occupied the same kind of position in Britain that the president did in America. And he was convinced that Edward VIII was his conduit to, to a, a, you know, a, a treaty, a non-aggression pact, whatever you like to call it, with Britain. And he got that one wrong. But he continued to believe, and he wasn't wrong about this, that because Edward was popular, because he was somebody who people had a, affection for, that if he was seen as being on the side of Germany, but, you know, your you man on the street would think, well, OK, everyone's telling us that Hitler's a rum sort of fellow with his Charlie Chaplin moustache and his, you know, tight leather trousers. But Duke of Windsor, you know, photograph next to him, they're having a gay old time. You know, he can't be that bad, can he? So, I mean, if you look at Duke of Windsor meeting Hitler in 37, it's just an astonishingly bad idea. Because you think, what's the benefit for him? Not that much. And what are the drawbacks? Well, the fact that people, you know, however many years later are going to be sitting around dissecting in great detail precisely why it was a bad idea for him to do it. So, yeah, I mean, when he was surrounded by people more intelligent than him, and Hitler's a great example of this, or more ruthless, more cunning, they would manipulate him and take advantage of him. So, OK, you think he would have kicked off about us going to war with Germany, but we do. You've already mentioned the swimming pool. Yeah. Uh, he does not cover himself in glory in terms of hindsight and looking back, does he, with his reaction to the outbreak of war? Where are they um, and how does he react? Well, they are in the south of France when war breaks out and it becomes important to get him back to Britain because it's thought that if he's in France and France is invaded and he's captured... That puts him in a very difficult position, puts the country in a very difficult position. But of course, given what happened the next year, when they go to Spain and then Portugal, and they're just hanging out with Nazis, you can see that, that the, you know, both the government and the, and the royal family are thinking, OK, what do we do now? I mean, what? because we can't control him. I never thought I'd say these words. In fairness to the Duke of Windsor, oh, oh my God, they're dirty. OK, Nazi. in fairness to him, though... He's not bright, but he's not necessarily lazy. He had a very industrious First World War. It's questionable how much use he was at certain times, but he was willing to put the work in. He didn't have other people do the jobs that he was given for him. He did them himself. Um, and he does present himself as willing to take a role like that again, doesn't he, at the beginning of the war? Yeah, well, I mean, the difficulty was, was that, OK, to his credit, what he did in going out to France... Because he he wanted to have a meaningful role because he was he had this you know rank of was like field marshal rank or something yeah but he basically lobs himself into everything he remembers his yeah. father doing in the first yeah. world war doesn't he but but he but he enjoys it he enjoys going out to to France he enjoys hanging around with the soldiers because what it was with Edward when I think he was happiest but he wasn't with Wallace was that he was basically he loved the idea of being around people like you know sailors or soldiers or you know about those sort of people and he's there sort of trying to be one of the lads and desmond fitzgerald says it to him on his 21st birthday doesn't he i can't give you the one thing you really want which is to be just like everybody else yeah and it's the thing is what's so interesting now is that i mean the definitive biography of edwards will always be i think the philip ziegler one mm -hmm. And I mean, I've occasionally thought about doing one myself, but actually, to be honest with you, I think that it would probably kill me just because <laughs> writing another book about it. Yeah, be... just there's only so much time you can spend in his head, I think. And actually, yes, it's 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 strange because whenever you do write a book like this, you do go in somebody's head. It's often quite a lonely, miserable place to be because you can see mm. with him it's the resentment. And it's funny actually because when I was out in um, I was out in Paris last year and I went to Le Maurice and the Plaza Raffinet where he and Wallace stayed. And at one point I was actually thinking to myself, because it's always very weird when you're staying in these suites that they once stayed at. Perfect job. And um, <laughs> I thought, if so, what what would the, if a Jacob Windsor's ghost was to visit me right now? How's that conversation going to go? And of course, yeah. the thing is, is that on the one hand, sort of, 95% of you thinking, I don't want to see the Duke of Windsor's ghost. 
And I yeah. said to you thinking, well, could I get some material to use in the next book? <laughs> and you could just imagine, you know, you've got all the references, Royal Archives, National Archives, interview with ghosts of Duke of Windsor. I find that being inside his head, he's is a very negative experience. He yeah. is a very negative person to be around. Um, and I find that when I do my stuff, I do his diaries and his letters in short bursts surrounded by George V's documents and Mary's yeah. documents and that, because to actually, to spend three days in the Royal Archives inside his head and doing nothing else, I feel like I've been beaten up when I leave. It's It's been really interesting for me because... I because re- I haven't written a book about somebody I, I really admire or like since my first book about Lord Rochester mm-hmm. and George the Sixth. You're sort of clinging on to as to somebody to like and to admire. Yeah, but there, is, there is a detachment there, and it's actually not till later when you get the full, you know, the tragic extent of what's happening that he becomes somebody that I think you know I, I find a very affecting figure. But because it, I mean, what I like is there's a there's a story that I quote about how he was in, in wartime. He he was absolutely petrified of enclosed spaces and petrified of heights, and he was being there was some inspection of a lighthouse, and he had to go up these incredibly long winding stairs, and he was sweating with a mixture of fear and panic and exhaustion, but he did it without complaining, because he what what he did was the opposite of what his brother did. He saw that as a man, he was this fragile, weak, flawed figure. Mm. But as a king, he couldn't be any of those things. And he had to subsume, you know, Bertie. I mean, because that, that's the thing, isn't it? That you're dealing with two people. You're dealing with George VI and Bertie. And Bertie is, you know, quite a pitiable figure in many ways. He's somebody who, like his brother, is dominated by his wife. And he's got this appalling speech defect which means he can barely get a sentence out but as king he really grows into it and he really becomes he does. and also as well as brits we love the underdog and in this scenario he is the underdog chris is nodding i don't know as the non-royal historian in the room chris i feel like bertie's the one you're rooting for because he didn't want the job that he's ended up with and yet he just does it the best he can he's not the greatest at it there's ever been but he does he could not give it any more Absolutely, yeah. Well, yeah, there's, there's definitely something about the underdog in, in this country, and so yeah, no, definitely the one you root for, George. I mean, because structurally, what I would hope is any, it's anyone who sits down to read um, of Windsor a, a War is that you start off and you think it's basically a book about Edward the Eighth and you know Duke of Windsor and Wallace with George and the Queen on backing vocals, and then about halfway through you should think it shifts and goes the other way and that the narrative should be about George VI and about Church and about Queen Elizabeth and that actually the Duke and Duchess of Windsor recede because they're just simply not as important and actually the story, I mean, the story's fascinating I and mean, what's happening in the Bahamas is a great, great story, but it's not as, to me, as dynamic and affecting as the fact that you've got this man who has become king. And yes, I mean, where it mirrors the crowning crisis, that's a book about a man who's doesn't want to be king and tries to give it up as soon as he has it. It succeeds in giving it up. But here, the narrative, I think, is the, it's the mirror image of that. It's somebody, again, who doesn't want to be king, but he tries on the mantle and actually he grows into it and he makes a success of it. Because, you know, by the by the E-Day, where he, when he's standing on the balcony and everyone's cheering him, it's quite sincere. Yeah. <laughs> could, you, could you imagine... Well, it's like the parallels with George V, isn't it? Yeah. Again, not supposed to be king, ends up being king. Nobody really, unknown entity when the war starts, a war starts, and by the end of it is is revered as the glue that's held the nation together. Well, precisely. And I feel that, it's, I mean, to me, it's one of those things that you look at royalty, and I mean, I find royalty fascinating from a psychological perspective. It's like, what must it be like to wake up and be king? Or be queen. I mean, what is it like? And this is something that I've been trying to, <laughs> trying to never apologise, never explain over the yeah, two, two books so far and another one to come. And it's so difficult because you think to yourself, it's the idea. I mean, I think I, I use the line, you know, 
being of a royal family is like a life sentence without the possibility of parole. And that must be how it feels. But OK, you're not in a jail cell. You're in the most opulent, lavish palace is known to man. But you can never relax. You can never be off duty. Yeah. You can all... never give it up. No. No retiring. No. And I mean, that's why Prince Harry and Meghan have been fascinating people so much, but fascinating people, because ultimately, well, where does it go? Because he's shot his bolt now. I mean, there's not a lot more he can do. Well, as the people that have, uh, you obviously have done post application a lot more than I have, but yeah. having, if, if they'd have read the script from the last time, they would have realised that actually the killer is when people stop talking about you. But what I find, I mean, we've always been, I mean, Britain and America are, I think, the two countries most fascinated by the royal family. I mean, I don't know if, say, France cares that much. But what I think is interesting is that we have, I think, a very high tolerance for, I mean, I was, I was asked to write a piece of it about Princess Beatrice the other day, and I'd honestly never given her any thought. I mean, I just, she's not somebody who's ever had any kind of, you know, I just literally had not given her the slightest moment's thought. But then it occurred to me that just because I haven't thought about her doesn't mean there's not a lot of people out there who, who actually do care about her. Because you think, I mean, I'm trying to think of a member of a royal family who is totally irrelevant, who is completely and utterly never discussed. I mean, because you see, someone like Zara Phillips, who has actually managed, as far as you can, to lead quite a normal life and not be dominated by the idea of royalty, who's essentially said, well, actually, do you know what? It's it's nice and I like, you know, dressing up and going to the events, but I'm really not very interested in being a member of the royal family. That does her great credit. Whereas I think, and I shan't name names because who knows who will be listening to this, but if you go the other way and this tiresome, tedious belief that people should kowtow to you and that people should be um you know buying you cocaine because you are a member of my member of the royal family behold my birthright yeah precisely and you think to yourself it still exists i mean that's this is what i find so extraordinary i mean again not to name names but the person i'm thinking of here has always had a very easy life purely yeah. because they are a minor member of the royal family with a noblesse oblige that comes along with that and you think to yourself when the Duke of Windsor, who was a major member of the royal family, tried to have a similar sense of noblesse oblige, I mean, on the one hand, he had, you know, a huge amount of money that he had in, in, in the bank, even if he complained it wasn't enough. He had a substantial income. Either he had banked a lot of money from the Duchy of Cornwall, hadn't he? It was about a million pounds, which, I mean, it's an extraordinarily large amount. I mean, he spent a fortune on, on Wallace. But um, it was just that thing that there was always the tramp fear. There was always the fear that they were going to be forced back into poverty. Because actually, yes, I mean, OK, they were living in the most luxurious of, of rented houses, but they were rented. I mean, it, it isn't as if they were, you know, constructing a property empire for themselves. And I just feel that, you know, what what we can see is that the Duke of Windsor should not be seen in isolation. He was not just some sort of, weird anomaly who came and went and that was the end of it what he says about the monarchy and about the institution of monarchy is not flattering he shows all of its worst features but also i mean you know we're talking about his energy and i mean show me a lazy royal i mean i can't think of one i mean i can't think of any of them who have you know in, in our lifetimes or beyond i mean edward the seventh he wasn't particularly energetic was he I don't know. I've seen that uh, the history hackers often discuss that chair of his in Paris. Yeah. Like, probably that uh, would have required some energy. Um, <laughs> in terms of oh, how to book, how to word this next question, so that it's not just tabloid clickbait. Um, it's fair to say that there are some plausible outcomes to the Second World War that could have been favourable to Edward, but did not tie in with British interests. How invested was he in those outcomes? If it suited him and he got a good deal out of it, was he willing to see Britain lose or suffer? Well, the question is, what was the, what was the worst case scenario? And I believe that the worst case scenario got worse with every month that went by in World War Two. Yeah. Let's say for sake of argument that Chamberlain was prime minister and that there'd been a sort of negotiated peace six months into World War Two, 
and that there'd never been a shot fired, never a bomb dropped, and that the whole thing was a bit abstract. But the negotiated peace came with one condition, that George VI had to abdicate and that Edward had to return as king. Now, would Chamberlain have got, gone along with that? I mean, we are, of course, in the realms of the counterfactual, but the question I would ask at that point is, what's Edward coming back for? Because he didn't like being king. He didn't enjoy the responsibilities. He didn't enjoy the having to, you know, go through his red boxes and stuff like that. So if you take the idea that we have a negotiated peace and that there's been no bloodshed, but Edward's back as president or king or whatever you call it, does he actually want the job? And I suspect the answer would be yes, if it wasn't a job at all. If he was told, right, you don't have to do anything constitutional, there isn't a prime minister for you to worry about, the country's being run from Germany, essentially, you just smile and wave and go off to Fort Belvedere with Wallace and everyone's happy. I think he'd been very happy about that. I think he'd been very happy about that when he got it. But the thing about him is he'll whine and bitch and complain about wanting something and then he gets it and then he's whining and bitching and complaining about wanting something else. That man is never happy. Well, it takes us back to Oscar Wilde, isn't it? You know, there's only, only one thing worse than not getting what you want, and that's getting it. Mm. And I feel that with him, I mean, he really would have been a great fit in an Oscar Wilde play. I mean, you can just imagine him coming on, Lord Windsor. And Lord Windsor is the character who comes on, and he always thinks that he's witty and spouting his epigrams. And everyone's like, but they're really second rate and really laboured. Because, I mean, Wallace was much wittier than he was, to her credit. I mean, one of my. One of my favourite bits in the book on Eden Wallace's life is after Sir Harry Oakes, who's a sort of, you know, squillionaire plutocrat, murdered it in the Bahamas. And the fact that Wallace's reaction is, oh, well, never a dull day in the Bahamas. It's just after like, they've been complaining about how dull the Bahamas yeah, are for about yeah, two years. Well, well, it's like, oh, well, you know, the man's, the man's died now, but, you know, it never gets boring, does it? But tell us about the Bahamas, because, yeah. I mean, why, what, what leads so they have to figure out what to do with him. He does start off being um sort of semi useful in a, a similar function to his father and what George VI will do in sort of just like geeing people up and epitomizing like a positive attitude to the war effort. How do we end up dumping them in the Bahamas? Well, what's happened basically is that Edward at this stage, Edward and Wallace are seen as being very, very dangerous and, and, and troublesome because it's for, but as long as they're in Europe, there's going to be something happening with the Nazis, whether they're physically kidnapped by the Nazis or passing on information or intelligence. And they are bad news. So what is done is that they are packed off, you know, quickly. And when they are in the Bahamas, it's for, they can be kept out of trouble. And of course, the, the Bahamas, you think about that, you think, oh, that sounds glamorous. But in the, in the 40s, it was not this sort of, you know, wonderful paradisic, paradise place. It was incredibly hot. It was quite a basic place. There was enormous racial tension. It was a place of enormous inequality. And Edward has been sent there because basically it's one of the few dominions of the crown that's quite small and he can't cause that much trouble. Well, because let's face it, he's going as a governor with absolutely yeah. no qualifications. Well, it's very interesting because something that I find is I have not met anybody yet who has defended the Duke of Windsor. I mean, there are biographers of him. I mean, Michael Block, for instance, mm. kinder towards him than I have been. And, and yet they say he did all right. Well, that's the interesting thing. It's like, mm. well, I mean, it's, it's one of those things that I often feel that, you know, the likes of you and I, if we had an entire day to sit down and analyse the various weaknesses and failings of the Duke of Windsor. I mean, we Which we're going to do in a pub at some point. We probably. are, we are. We'll, we'll be very drunk and very angry by the end of it. Yeah. But, <laughs> but if we came to his governorship, was he a bad governor? And you look at it and you think, uh, it's a really hard one to answer. I mean, he wasn't good. He wasn't in any sense, actually, you know, he didn't turn it round, didn't make the place better. But he didn't <laughs> fuck it up. Like Tony Pulis. <laughs> yeah, he's back to being Tony Pulis, isn't he? <laughs> but did he fuck it up? I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, it's one of those things you, you can argue that there are things he did which actually made the racial divisions worse. Mm. You can argue that the Harry Oakes thing, it was an absolute debacle. And that he so this is a murder, it. isn't it, that happens in the Bahamas? Yeah. And it, it's, it's one of those funny things because when you write a book like this, you've got these things coming towards you that you know you have to research and write. 
chapters. Mm. And I thought this was going to be quite a fun chapter because I thought it was going to be basically the Duke of Windsor plays detective. And I thought, well, he's done everything else. Why shouldn't he be Sherlock Holmes for a bit? But in fact, he didn't really do any detecting. What he tried to do instead was to hus- hush the whole thing up, get somebody convicted pronto, and Bob's your uncle. And actually what you see there is it's more about the fact that it really split the partners down these sort of racial, social lines in terms of this playboy who was accused because Oakes, he was the son-in-law of Oakes and he'd been heard to threaten him and things like that. Now, of course, it's one of the most famous unsolved murders of all time. And I would say it's more likely than not that the person accused of it did it because he had motive, he had opportunity. What he didn't have was the prints on the murder weapon, which were found and then it was revealed they'd been put there by a, you know, an overzealous detective desperate for conviction. But if it wasn't him, then who else was it? Because it's one of those things, there have been so many books about this subject, and every single one of these books gets more and more outlandish and more and more ridiculous. But the problem is, is that when it comes to the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, people get overexcited. I mean, there's at least one major, I said major, there's at least one biographer and historian who's wrote a, quite a popular recent book. And it's a book that I would look at and I think, hmm, none of this is actually true. A lot of it's supposition, which you're presenting as truth. But actually what you have done is underneath your facade of learning and erudition, you've merely trotted out a load of gossip, a load of hearsay, a load of false, false rumours and conjecture. And it's always difficult because ultimately the, the facts are, they, they speak for themselves. The Duke of Windsor was a man of enormous, you know, difficulty, of, of enormous complexity. Why did he start making stuff up? Yeah, it's not. I mean, you don't you don't need any additional drama. Chris, um, hit us with something that is just it sounds like it's made up, but it's absolutely not. I'm talking I know, about the Walter Schellenberg stuff. Uh, talking about overexcited um i actually know who walter schellenberg is i've got his autobiography on my shelf over there and i've read it um but for people who aren't as nerdy as i am um, do you want to tell us who walter schellenberg was and um what his james bond desk links to the duke are yeah sure well schellenberg was this man who was a sort of a, a very ambitious member of the ss and mm. his task was essentially to seduce or capture by any means possible the Duke and Duchess of Windsor while they were in Portugal. And it's always interesting because, I mean, the book is subtitled The Nazi Threat to the Crown. And it's funny, the original subtitle was The Royals and the Nazis, but my publisher preferred this one, and I was perfectly happy with that. But what I always thought is, you got the Nazis, you got the Crown. And in the case of Schellenberg, it's very much the Nazi threat to the Crown because Schellenberg was a really interesting character because he wasn't executed after the end of the war. He he managed to, you know, I think he got a relatively light prison sentence because he was one of the many people who said, well, you know, I was good at my job, but it was only a job, wasn't it? I wasn't really that bad. And certainly when it came to his actions with the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, it was like he was playing a very intricate game of chess with them because he knew that there was an open door to be pushed at in terms of their loyalties and their sympathies. And he knew that there was the possibility of luring them into something massively compromising. Because, I mean, look at 37 all over again. The Duke of Windsor did not need to say to Hitler, I'm a Nazi, for the propaganda triumph to be complete. Just the picture, the photo of them shaking hands is enough. Yeah, Yeah, precisely. Just as in 1940... They didn't, I mean, this is what they didn't understand because Schellenberg was trying to essentially retain the, the habeas corpus of the Duke. He wanted to physically have him in person. And of course, they went off to the Bahamas and Schellenberg watched the depart and thought, ah, oh, my plan's been foiled. But of course, it hadn't been because, I mean, that's what, you know, when all this was revealed in, in the Mayberg files later, it's absolutely clear that the plan had succeeded, that the Duke of Windsor's actions were treason. And there's no other way of putting it. Now, I mean, the course, fact that we still sit here debating whether or not he was a Nazi now, does that not mean that the Nazis were at least part, in part successful in, in whatever crap they were trying to pull? Well, all right. This is the way I see it. Diana Mitford and Oswald Mosley went to prison. Yes. What did the Duke and Duchess do that didn't merit their going to prison? 
Yeah, you you believe they belong in the next cell. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't see any actual reason why their actions in Portugal alone didn't put them in there, because it's it was essentially what what Mosley and Mitford were doing. So you think to yourself, yeah, okay, but he committed treason. Now you see what I. <laughs> I'm just waiting to see how this one goes down when the book comes out. That the book begins with the bombing of Buckingham Palace in September 1940. And I suggest... Not my birthday. That... <laughs> yeah. Well, but I... I was caught, but yeah. No, it was just... <laughs> but I suggest that it is more likely than not. The reason because it was a very, very targeted attack. And it was a blessing that no members of the royal family were seriously injured or killed. Because the bomber knew exactly what he was doing. And the bombing took, you know, they basically went in and the bomb landed at the absolute heart of the private apartments of Buckingham Palace. And you think to yourself, OK, whoever bombed it had to know what they were doing. So they had to get that intelligence from somewhere. And OK, yeah, sure, there's a lot of people out there who knew something of the workings of Buckingham Palace. But you're thinking, so all right, which ex-king who used to live at Buckingham Palace has been hanging around with Nazis a couple of months before the bombing? And has seen another war at Buckingham Palace and how everything threw down security wise, bombing raid wise. There were protocols and stuff. I mean, I think basically the protocol at the beginning was run for the middle of the building and stay on a lower floor, which, of course, the King and Queen did not do. They run for the balconies just like everybody else. But I mean, he he has seen it at work in wartime as well. And so what I start because basically it's one of those things I can imagine there are going to be people who say that's not possible. Of course, he didn't want his brother to die. I think I don't know. I mean, I this is a, the difficulty is is that you know, people ask me questions that I that I have to equivocate on, and this is the one that I did. Edward want his brother to be killed? I don't know because the argument against is that he you know he was annoyed with his brother, he was frustrated by his brother, he obviously thought his brother was somebody who was getting in the way, but he did he hate him so much he actually wished for his death? I don't think he did. But did he see, with his brother out the way, that a comeback would be so much easier? Because, OK, let's say that it's, it's a tragic loss. But if the king had been killed in wartime, the morale blow would have been absolutely catastrophic. It's just one of those things that they didn't see how these things looked in terms of, 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 of the wider optics of it all. And so, but yeah... This I, is coming back to his not being very bright, isn't it? Yeah, and I think what we, I mean, I think I say this explicitly in the book. On you know, on balance, I don't actually believe Edward wanted to, to, to see his brother die. I don't think he, he's not an evil man. I think it's important. No, that but I'm, I'm not sure how sorry he would have been if it had happened, though. No, no. I don't think he was willing it to happen. No, I mean. <laughs> He's not evil because he's not somebody who goes out of his way to connive in the unhappiness of others. Mm. It's just he's not actually that bothered by it either. No. So yeah, we we can you know we can say he probably didn't intend this was going to happen. But if you're sitting down and there's this chap who's showing a really you know really detailed interest in exactly what Bucky Palace looks like, and this chap's also you know been hanging around with Nazis quite a bit. You might think to yourself, I'm not going to give him the grand tour because there's a possibility this could all go a bit wrong, isn't there? I was going to, we were going to go all the way through to the post-war world in that, but now I know you're doing a third book. I'm not going to because you need to come back and talk about that as well. But let's end then yeah. with um, how they're feeling by the end of the war. I'm probably quite sorry for themselves and... <laughs> we would laugh because it would be completely insular and selfish. But by the time D-Day rolls around, it's fair to say that the Duke and Duchess feel pretty sorry for themselves, isn't it? Well, I mean, as I said, I mean, what I'm hoping is that if you read book, that you'll start off thinking this is a book about Edward and Wallace. And by the end, they've actually dwindled into irrelevance because the book is not about them anymore. Because, yeah, they're, they're, these, they're these diminished figures. They're not actually at the centre of events anymore. The Bahamas has finished, you know, they don't have a role to go to. There's been nothing found for them. And Edward comes back to, to Britain in late 45. And it's funny because after years and years and years, but he's desperate to come back and he's being very much pushed away. He comes back and is all of a sudden it's like, oh, I'm yesterday's news. Nobody cares about me. 
you know, there isn't this sense of a public right. wanting. Well, they've done six years of war, uh, yeah. the abdication now. I mean, at the point where Munich happens in 38, the last crisis the British people remember is the abdication. It was a massive deal. But by 1945, yeah, you've forgotten him. Well, precisely. And it's one of those things that I think that the obsolescence was something that he found very hard to deal with, which is why, and again, we'll, we'll talk about this next time, why he wrote this memoir, which essentially cast him in a very different light. And even though most of it was made up, it was an attempt to regain relevance. But certainly, yeah, at the end of the Second World War, you can see that George VI has proved himself. You can see that he has proved that he is able to be king, to unite the nation and to become an inspirational figure and has overcome his own personal difficulties. I mean, it's, it's a classic Hollywood sports movie, isn't it? But in yeah, the last I mean, movie, it is Return of the Titans, but with a good yeah. ending, isn't it? Yeah. And actually, I mean, what's really nice writing about... Remember the Titans, sorry, before someone comes in and starts creating... Will, won't you? But, what you? but writing a book like this, it's quite nice because, you know, the goodies win. The baddies, yeah. the, the, the baddies get their comeuppance. And... You know, I'm sure there'll be people who say, oh, why isn't this book revisionist? You know, you've been too kind to George VI, you've been too harsh to the Duke of Windsor. And I'll say, yeah, OK, fine. If if you see it differently, that's your prerogative. And I'm really glad that there'll be people out there who want to defend the Duke of Windsor. I'm really glad there'll be people out there who want to cast to Bertie because that makes it more interesting. And it means you can have an honest debate and you can have an honest discussion. And tell them why they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do you know what? I mean, as I say, there is always a point at which you think to yourself, well, actually, do you know what? I don't want to be that harsh about Duke of Windsor because ultimately you just sound like you're weirdly obsessed. But there's yeah. also a point you just have to say, oh, come on. I mean, really? <laughs> yeah, I think when, when people say, like, he can't possibly be that bad, you're being a drama queen, I, I point them to the first series of The Crown and I say, you know, when you're watching that and you think this whole pantomime performance, this guy's turning is hilarious, but it's so over the top. You're like, no, it doesn't go far enough. For reality actually it needs to be more pantomime and more ludicrous well precisely and actually i think alex jennings is brilliant as the duke of windsor i think he's i was really pleased in the last series that he comes back for cameo because it's one of those things that you're, you're always missing him when he's not on screen and i don't think Derek jacoby was nearly as good as uh, the duke of windsor when he appears because it's just Derek jacoby being Derek jacoby really <laughs> And, but I mean, I've, I've always hoped, I mean, you know, and any producers listen to this, um, film rights are still available. I've always hoped that there would be a prequel to The Crown, which would deal with the royal family in this period. Because to me, I mean, if you're looking at, say, series four of The Crown, I mean, I don't remember what happened in that. But if you're looking at this time, you know, you've got betrayal, you've got bombings, you've got Nazis, you've got, you know, the Bahamas you've got everything I mean it is all human life and so yeah I mean just to get back to what we were saying at the start of our conversation having the bloody bible as your epigraph might sound like you're setting out a pretty big store for it to live up to but then I would hope that anyone gets to the end of the book and thinks yeah it really was biblical wasn't it <laughs> it absolutely is biblical uh, and I know that like oh, as soon as the embargo's off Chris Chris you can have it I promise um, but yeah, it, it was, it's a fantastic read. I urge everybody to go and buy it. We'll put it on the History Hack bookstore. Alex, you've been fantastic. Uh, we're now going to discuss going to a pub um, and getting drunk and having this conversation. <laughs> and, uh, perhaps I'll buy the beers. Yeah, but <laughs> not being quite so diplomatic. I think Chris is just going to keep going to the bar for us and uh, yeah. listening. Lots of very strong German lager, I think, which you would like that. Yeah. Sounds good. <laughs> Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section thank you so much for your continued support we really appreciate our listeners and supporters so make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book